Hi and welcome to another episode of Rob's Triathlon Tips for Beginners. This isn't a triathlon video, but uh, I thought it was something really important for me to share to potentially help uh, people with their health. Uh, I've got to have my disclaimer because it's a health related video. I'm not a doctor. This is not medical advice. It's just an account of how I did some learning and some troubleshooting of my own health and eventually figured out how to sort out my blood pressure. Uh, so a little bit of history of the problem I had back in about December 2021. Um, I visited my family doctor and they measured my blood pressure and it was about 155 over 110, which is not horrifying, but it officially qualifies as high blood pressure and not just hypertension um, and my doctor said you know what you're you're fit you don't smoke you don't drink a lot of alcohol you don't do drugs you eat a healthy diet so you must just be genetically susceptible to high blood pressure because I mean other people in your family are on medication for it, so I guess you're just old and you're just screwed. <laughs> Which is very disappointing to hear from your your family doctor that that's it. You're just you're just done. You're just there's nothing I can do for you. I mean, the typical advice that the doctor will give you in a scenario like that is, oh, you should uh, try to reduce your stress. As though that's something you can do really easily and just you just flip a switch stress off right and you should eat less salt right <laughs> and and from what I've been able to to tell like that's inevitably doesn't do enough and people end up getting prescribed a drug for their blood pressure for the rest of their life and uh, I mean to be clear Blaming vague things like stress and, and your genetics for your health problems is, is a cop-out that doctors like to use because they don't know what else to tell you. And why is that? Uh, when you watch hundreds of hours of videos on health like I've done, you eventually find doctors that are honest about their schooling. And they will admit that they're taught almost nothing about nutrition in school, which is disgusting. And uh, what they learn about nutrition is also antiquated. And they know that, uh, and if you find doctors that are very knowledgeable in nutrition, I mean, they've done the work after uh, graduating from school. They've, they've done other training. They've become a functional medical doctor like functional medicine is is a term that you may come across they they've they've taught themselves about nutrition in their spare time or they learn from a colleague that's enlightened about nutrition uh, and school doctors are taught how to diagnose problems and medicate them and in extreme circumstances how to perform surgery right surgery should be a last resort uh, many of the drugs that doctors uh, prescribed to patients don't even fix problems either uh, all they do is manage your symptoms and they don't do anything to get to the the root cause of your problems and so the drug companies have a lifelong uh, patient uh, customer for money <laughs> it's 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 like you've heard probably follow the money and that that's what's going on in these situations uh, I mean if you go and see your doctor and they have nothing to offer you for your health problem but a drug to take for the rest of your, li of your life, you don't have a health care provider, you have a licensed drug dealer. Your response to a situation like that should be to take responsibility for your own health, educate yourself, and find a better doctor. I guess that's enough of me ranting for now, so let, I'll go back to the topic of this video, which is blood pressure. <laughs> uh, I've made some videos about switching to a low-carb diet after using a continuous glucose monitor and confirming that I have insulin resistance, and then how I was able to complete an Ironman as a low-carb athlete. I mean, in terms of insulin resistance, there are 
different patterns of insulin resistance, I guess you would call it. I had more of a reactive insulin resistance, which means like when I would eat a bunch of carbs, my blood sugar would spike and then it would stay elevated for three to four hours and then it would come crashing down and I'd go hypoglycemic. And if I didn't eat too many carbs, my blood sugar would be absolutely fine. It'd be in this sort of tight range and I would feel great. You can also have what some people call functional hypoglycemia. That's where your blood sugar is, is really low all the time, all day and during your sleep too, unless you eat something. And when you eat something, your blood sugar comes crashing back to being low really quickly because your problem isn't your blood sugar. Your problem is that you have become so insulin resistant, the cells of your muscles and your liver specifically, that um, it's like when you, when you eat something to raise your blood sugar, it's like trying to put out a raging fire with a little water gun. It's not gonna do anything. The, you may feel like, when, you, when you're a person with hypoglycemia like that, you may have symptoms like being hangry all the time, having mental fog, getting headaches, having a crappy quality of sleep. And it's related to your insulin resistance. Uh, you get hangry because other than your, your if, you, if you don't eat something for a while, one of the things your body tries to do is uh, gluconeogenesis. It's where your liver will make glucose if you're not getting glucose from eating. And like I said, it's like in the case of having chronically high insulin, it's not gonna do anything. It's not gonna put out that raging fire. Of <laughs> and the other thing your body does when, you're, when your blood sugar drops is it releases cortisol, which is one of the stress hormones. So that's why you get hangry. And then, and now that you understand that, think of the fact that if you're a person with hypoglycemia like this, when you're sleeping, your body you, and your blood sugar is low, your stress level is elevated. So it should make perfect sense why you may be having like really bad quality sleep, why you might wake up in the middle of the night even in a panic attack because you're literally trying to sleep through stress. <laughs> and, and the crazy thing is that doctors don't diagnose patients for insulin. And some of them will say, oh, it's, oh, it's because there's no established guidelines for what an acceptable level of fasting insulin is. And that's just a lame excuse. There are plenty of resources you can look at to come up with your own sort of guidelines and test your patients for insulin resistance. Um, and, a, and a hypoglycemic person is typically given a clean bill of health because their blood sugar is low. And, and they're told this stupid, this like backwards advice of just eat more often and you'll raise your blood sugar and you'll feel better, which ignores the problem that they have chronically high insulin, which is incredibly damaging to your body and your mind. It's just, it's typical bad medical advice. Um, but not everyone with hypoglycemia will, will end up with prediabetes or type to diabetes. What can happen over time though is that your muscle and liver cells become so resistant to your insulin that your pancreas cannot make enough insulin to get glucose into your muscle and liver cells as glycogen. And then your blood sugar starts to creep up over time. Now your doctor says you got prediabetes or type 2 diabetes looking at your fasting blood glucose and your and and your other markers when really you've had this problem um, in the background for like a decade 10 15 years leading you to get type 2 diabetes and a typical doctor will treat your symptom your blood sugar first they'll they'll prescribe you metformin which initially does what you want it to do it helps 
reverse your insulin resistance. But it doesn't work forever, and then you inevitably end up prescribed insulin. But your problem isn't that you don't have enough insulin in your body. <laughs> you have too much. And the more insulin you inject into yourself to control your blood sugar, the more resistant you become to insulin, the more insulin you need to inject. It's a never-ending cycle that ends up in you dying prematurely. You gain weight, you get high blood pressure, you get cholesterol issues, you're more likely to get cancer, you're more likely to have mental health issues, and so on and so on. It's a, it's a health disaster. All because your doctor is too stupid to treat the root cause of your problem. In terms of blood pressure, insulin resistance does two things that contribute to high blood pressure. Number one, it causes plaque buildup in your arteries, also known as atherosclerosis. I think I pronounced that properly. Number two, it causes your body to retain salt, which makes your body retain fluid. So of course, doctors, typically blaming the wrong thing, blame salt and tell you to cut back on salt. And cutting back on salt is advice that ignores the bigger picture, which is the root cause, which is insulin resistance. <laughs> and there was even a, a report from the World Health Organization very recently saying, we have this global crisis and people are eating too much salt and it's going to kill us all. Like, and everybody on Twitter who's in the know about insulin resistance ro is just rolling their eyes at the, how ridiculous that is. But anyway, I switched to a low-carb diet and did intermittent fasting and did some fasted exercise to fix my insulin resistance. And I would say it took about three to four months to be like truly corrected. And my blood pressure dropped from 155 over 110 to about 132 over 92 within that time period. And there isn't a drug that will do that much for your blood pressure. There just isn't. You can't get those results with a drug. But then my blood pressure was just frustratingly stuck at that, at that range, 132-ish over 92-ish. And in every other health marker uh, for my body was perfectly fine. So, I mean, what else did I try to improve my blood pressure after that? I mean, I eliminated caffeine for a while because I thought maybe that's the problem. I supplemented things like coenzyme Q10, omega-3 fish oil, garlic. I had beet and ginger smoothies because, you know, beets have nitric oxide and that's potentially helpful for you. I was adding milled flaxseed to my yogurt because that might help. I tried apple cider vinegar because that seems to help with other problems. I was supplementing potassium and magnesium. I mean, you name it. I've tried all kinds of things that all did nothing to get me over that hump to get my blood pressure down to what's considered ideal. I mean, you would not believe how many stupid videos there are on YouTube about, you know, make this tonic with lemon juice and blah, 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 and it will lower your blood pressure by five points or something. It's like, come on, it's just stupid. <laughs> that appeals to, to the people that just like want quick and easy answers and doesn't actually like address the root cause again. And it, it, it was only when I watched a video recently from a cardiologist called Dr. Pradeep Jamnadas uh, in the United States about vitamin K2 that really lit this light bulb in my head. He's the kind of doctor that you want to seek out advice from. His approach is to help his patients who've had a heart attack not have one again or who are at risk of having one to not have one by healing them with nutritional advice. He doesn't want people on his operating table. So like in a nutshell, what he talks about in this video, which is uh, I added to my nutrition playlist on my channel, 
is that we all know that calcium is important for our bones. And many of us have been told to take uh, vitamin D as a supplement or, or get enough sunshine. Uh, and some people just think that's to do with your immune system. But vitamin D also helps you absorb the calcium that you eat. And it helps to get that into your bloodstream. But then it isn't necessarily mobilized to where it's needed, to your teeth, your bones, your joints, uh, if you're deficient in vitamin K2. And that can lead over time to calcification in your arteries. Man, I was just like, why do people not know this? This is crazy. And so I started taking uh, a vitamin K2 supplement uh, a supplement that has both vitamin K2 and vitamin D3 in one pill. Just one pill, once a day. And they're both uh, fat-soluble vitamins. So they come in a sort of a pill with some oil in it, I think. And my blood pressure dropped in one month to 121 over 85. And I'm going to keep monitoring it to see if it continues to improve. But... Uh, I mean, so it, it was. It took me a while to get over that final hump to get my blood pressure down to where it should be, and, and now it's there. And I reflect on looking back, like my doctor blaming my genetics, and it's just complete BS. And I, and and I'm not going to go back to that doctor anymore, obviously, because they're going to give me useless advice. <laughs> sure, if you want to take. Um, drugs for like antibiotics for an infection that makes sense or you need to take insulin because you're a type 1 diabetic and can't make insulin that makes sense but you do not necessarily need drugs for all of your problems if you go to your doctor and you say like oh I heard about vitamin K2 and their response is along the lines of well isn't it nice that there's just so many doctors out there on the internet Oh, as, a, as though they're trying to dismiss it because they don't know anything about it then you frankly need a new doctor that's a terrible attitude for a doctor to have their response should be that they'll look into it because it sounds interesting and potentially beneficial to their patients and, right? that's a proper doctor I mean it's like the famous quote from Hippocrates I believe let food be thy medicine right i'm going to continue to make um videos about triathlon related subjects but i'm also going to keep making videos like this about health about things like cholesterol and uh, how you will fail to lose weight long term and the calories in calories out model and why other things like that in the future to hopefully help people with health uh, if if you found this video to be useful please give it a like and share it with your friends and family who may benefit from it thank you